Hi, I'm Kim Mackrell. Welcome to this presentation on practice. I know from my own experience of practice that uh, it can inspire a whole range of emotions from um, elation when it goes really well to abject misery and tears of frustration when it's not going so well. So I hope that this video uh, gives you a bit of a way in if you are feeling stuck and some ideas to help you structure your practice and uh, get the most out of it for yourselves. Um, and uh, I will, oh, most of all, to enjoy it. That's, um, that's the priority there. I will be answering questions after the video, so please do send them in via chat and uh, I will do my best to answer any queries. I hope to see some of you later. I've enlisted the help of Lynn Cook, who is a very old friend of mine, and uh, we were at music college together. Lynn is a violinist, um, a very experienced teacher, wonderful teacher. Uh, we also have Jasper, who will not be moved, so he's joined us. Um, not sure how helpful be, he'll be, but he will be a constant. Um, this, as this is a video, the hope is that at some point you can replay it if you've missed something or if you want to go over another point, or you can contact me, of course, through the Chalice Society if you need any reminders of, of anything that was talked about and you can't re-access. Um, in discussion with Lynn, we've discovered that um, for both of us, it's in some ways made us reassess our own practice mm. and also our teaching, because as teachers, half of our mission is to teach them to practice, because that's where the bulk of the improvement happens. So, um, so we will get going now. I was thinking that actually, um, when you're when the music or your instrument is not your principal thing in your life, it may be in terms of your love, you know. But um, when you've got a job to do, or you've got children to look after, or whatever, or a parent to look after, I don't know what the situation is, but you haven't got hours to practice. You really do sort of need to get the most for the least, don't you? Mm -hmm. And so we, I know we've been thinking about that in our professional life because if you're on tour or you've got a suddenly somebody says can you come and do this next week we have to get the most for the least so it does it is very helpful for all sorts of people to to think about this and I think for me I've discovered not only for myself but also for my pupils it does seem to work that one note practice is very very calming and you can get so much from practicing one note and interestingly enough uh, that was handed down to me from a fantastic riddle player um, <clears throat> but he got it from a flautist and apparently wind players spend a lot of time focusing on one note and uh, it's the the benefits of that are just enormous I, yeah. I, I, I can't I can't stress it enough mm -hmm. and it's also very it's quite zen, you know, you can just focus on that one note, it opens up your ear and then it, it's, it, it, it just, when you think about the centre of the note, it cures a whole load of ills just mm. for one thing. Yes. And the good thing is, also, if you are practising and you don't have that much time, doing exactly that, so if I, if I focus on my one note and I'm focusing on the change of sound as I do it, and I start to feel the vibration of the, the wood, and I start to yeah, feel the vibration yeah. of the cello. And all the time I'm doing is I can alter things in my body and see what effect that has on the sound. to get a lovely feeling as if you're being massaged once mm. everything starts to vibrate. <clears throat> yeah. And that you don't have to do that for hours and hours, so it's a really, yeah. really good point, yeah. that one. Yeah, and, and um, everybody's tempted to do masses in a practice session, you know, the same, if, you, if you're having a problem with one particular passage, to play it a thousand times quickly, just, oh, get it right, get it right, oh, get it right now, and then of course it's not right the next time you come to do it, or under a different set of circumstances in a different room, 
or a different amount of energy that you're using because somebody else is listening and we know how awful how it, that changes everything mm -hmm. doesn't it when somebody else is listening it's a no-no yeah absolutely no-no so we, we have to be really certain I <clears throat> it's interesting how many great players go right the way back to basics right the way back to this listening to one note doing their open string work mm -hmm. I'm sure Rostropovich Roy Strach Whoever you want to mention, I bet they did an awful lot of open string work, even when they were grand, grand masters. Yeah. Yeah. And it shows. It, sh it shows. And it shows. It shows. Of course, it shows. Total control. Yes. Total control of the sound that they're making at any single yes. point. Yes. With the calmness. Yes. With the calmness. The calmness, adaptability to any any change in the music in the yes. nuance yes yeah absolutely it shows yeah. i think a good analogy is probably with driving when we're very experienced drivers we're quite calm when we drive even when something happens whereas early drivers want to be driving you know it's faster and it's, it's everything mm. no 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 just sit there and relax and uh, it's and funny that you use that analogy because in um uh one of the clips i've done i also use that analogy as when you when you're learning to drive you stall often and it's through that stalling that you learn how to keep going yes. really you yes, learn how to yes. override that as it's about to happen and you're gaining that lovely lovely sense of um, yeah. control yeah yeah so maybe if you can take me through what you think would be a really good practice regime so say for instance i've been at work all day and the kids have been fed, I've got 20 minutes to practice. What would you recommend? Um, it would, I think that actually this would go for all standards probably. I think we're akin to what we're talking about, doing a slow scale. And it's like, oh yeah, everybody always does this to me, do slow scales, but it's just a little bit different. So why don't we do, um, Let's do something that encompasses all the strings. Why don't we do C major? That suits me fine. Two octaves. Okay. So about sort of that sort of speed for each node. Yeah. Okay. Single bows. Single bows. Yeah. Okay. or more with this one thing but we're only talking about 20 minutes so I think the first thing to do is to say uh, what 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 comfort what did you feel when you went when you first did it with the two octaves coming back down again what did I first feel yeah what did you uh, feel uh, rusty okay. insecure okay. and um, stiff okay Let's see if we can just just take uh, play me the first two notes, play C and then a D because we'll see the D is in relation to the C. So start off with the open string, but then then ha hang around on the D until I tell you to go on to the next okay. note. Okay. <laughs> Thing. I mean, obviously, it's much more noticeable because we hung around on the note. If 
you focus on the centre of the note and try and alter your bowing to the centre of the note as you go. In other words, loosen up and just, just release a little bit at the heel. Yeah. Just try, just see how it feels. opening the ear up yeah. it's um it's also illustrating uh bowing not faults but inadequacies yes. in a way yes. so each of the bow changes to me sounded very clunky and just the smoothness of the bow and the consistency of the bow yeah. Yeah. um and as you say that that can affect the pitch. Yes, absolutely. How about we do it again and use use more bow pressure? Use more bow pressure. Okay, so more weight in yeah, more, more weight, weight in more the arm. More weight in the arm. Yes. Okay, single bows or single bows and go, okay. go a little bit faster in the arm, otherwise it's going to crunch a bit too much. Okay. <laughs> more 
push it a little bit faster back. Okay. <laughs> thought of a triangle there's a, a triangle which is made up of the speed of the bow the weight of the arm and uh, the placing the of the bow yeah. and exactly the sound point and I think of this as a kind of magic triangle mm -hmm. and if you adjust any one of those and it's quite fun to play with it it's a good bit of detective work we're, on the, we're thinking yeah. the same because I was going to suggest doing something for, for those of you, uh, those people who maybe do photography in the old fashioned sense with the old SLR cameras, if you get the aperture and the, the shutter speed wrong, yeah, you, um, completely. It, it was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And that for me is the sound point, the bow speed, and the pressure. Because mm -hmm. they are the things which create exactly the sound isn't it so mm -hmm. let's do it let's do it wrong now so let's do so a, a, a basic rule is that the faster you go the more pressure you can use and the less bow you have to use that is a general rule there are people who can pretty you know you kind of mix and match depending upon what sort of sound but really to get the optimum sound coming from that piece of wire expensive wire mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, we need to be very aware of, 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 of you know, I mean, as we, we go on um, um, in our skills, we our ear will adjust it for us, our muscles will, will know what to do. We don't, we're not even aware we're doing it. It's like walking with the right sort of pressure. You don't stomp on the pavement and go. Um, so why don't we, um, why don't we do something, use too much pressure with a very slow bow? Okay. Make it really hideous. Mm -hmm. Would you like it near the bridge as well? Why don't we do one thing? Let's take one thing at a time from the triangle. Okay, yeah? so why don't we do... This is too much pressure, is it? Too much pressure. With a slow bow. With a slow bow. Okay. Good. Yeah, so that's obviously... Now use the same pressure, but use a faster bow. Okay, here we go. close to the bridge mm -hmm. with the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is the closer you are to the bridge, the harder it is to use a faster bow. So when you want to slow the bow down, say for instance you're, you're playing a big melody which you want to be near the bridge because you want this massive sound and you don't want to use too much bow you go near the bridge because it also naturally it's like putting the brakes on the bow yes, yes. with optimum effect as well so yes that was that was pretty gross <laughs> <laughs> let's use um let's use a light a light let's do something where we can use a lighter bow so um uh, so slow, slow and light, but not, yeah, and um, so you could do that near the bridge, couldn't you? Could you? Slow and light. So, so, because, it, you know, if you wanted a really nice French sound, you could have that mm. sort of sound. Uh, no, actually, no, you'd go over the finger. Well, we uh, More to the finger. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to try it first near just the bridge. Try, try and it, just try see. It. So slow, what did you say? Faster? Yeah, we, I, I'm trying to get you to use a lighter bow. A lighter bow. Just to okay. experiment with the lighter bow. Yes. Pond. Pond, yes. yes. Which you might want to, and that's a good yeah. thing to practice because we need to have that. See, the thing about this is 
is so much detail here and it may it may be daunting for some people oh i don't know what to think of first but after a few practice sessions of this it actually makes it interesting and you'll find that you'll do you'll want to continue i think it's quite uh, motivating to mm. do practice like this because mm. it gets more interesting yeah it's giving you the tools to, yes yes so then when you apply this to the piece of music yes. you know, it could be french it could be brahms it could be it could be Shostakovich, yeah. where you want, you know, maximum weight. Yes. And, and so it gives you the tools to apply that yes. to any piece. And it starts to become almost an unconscious thing. Yes. Yes. We so have to form our tools first, don't we? Yeah, have exactly. To form them. Exactly. Yes. That's what the practice process is. Yes, yes. As in the driving, you don't stall nearly as much when you're an adult. Yeah. Not completely out of the question, but... Yeah, yeah. Should we talk about... Um, just a little bit about how to focus on the centre of the note. That's, yeah. that's quite a that's quite a big thing. Obviously, with mm. the cello, you've got a wider note to mm. folk to listen to. We all, I mean, I would encourage people to do as much listening to bad players and good players mm -hmm. as well, both of those, mm -hmm. so that you can differentiate in your ear between somebody who plays on the high edge of the note and somebody who plays on the low edge of the note, which is always making you want to go. Oh, it's oh, oh, slightly oh. depressing, yes. isn't it? It weighs it, you it's down. Just yes. constantly want them to move up. And people who play on the high edge, it doesn't feel so bad, but after a while, mm -hmm. it's it's sort of, oh, yes. uh, yeah. calm down a bit. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, People and singers are always talk, great singers are always talking about the middle of the note, the mm -hmm. centre of the note. Because mm -hmm. you can come above and you can come below, but you have to know when you're in the centre. And that's like being, what is that like being? I don't know, that's like just being in the right chair. Yeah. You're just sitting in the right chair. You can lean out of it to get something and you can lean back in it like this. But when you're in the right chair, it's good for your back, it's good mm -hmm. for everything, you, can, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, should we um, just, yeah, just play, yeah. um, what, what's, what's your most comfortable finger? I'm, mm, let's say the second. Okay. That's fairly central, let's say the yeah. second finger. Yeah, okay, so just choose any note you want. Okay, I'm going to choose an A because it rings nicely. Okay. So nice. what am I going to do with it? Just listen to it? Just listen to it for a minute. Mm -hmm. Whether it's going up or whether it's going down, and then we'll talk about altering with, without without moving your hand. to get 
get too technical and go, well, how do I know which ear I need? It's just so that your ear can actually, mm. we're opening up the ear here. Mm. I think that's the key to everything. Mm. Opening up the ear. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't always happen immediately. That's the other yes, thing to remember, yes, yes. is that the ear uh, needs practice. Yes. In listen listening takes practice. But I've always thought that if you think of removing your ears and placing them on the stand in front of you, then you get a much more objective view of what that note is. Yeah. But sometimes when you're in it, yes. it's quite difficult to hear. And it can make you a little bit anxious in a way. So I think if, if it does have that effect, it's, it's just a consistent, every time you practice, just exercising your ears. And I think you learn to hear things differently. Yeah, so that's, that's very, very good. And it's something that even great players, really great players, can do, can make a mistake with, or they, that lack of concentration or whatever. Yeah. And suddenly you hear them just squeeze the note, you mm. know. Yeah. Because of course, nobody would ever, we're not talking about this for intonation. Mm. We're talking about squeezing the note. Mm. But as we demonstrated there, it makes a huge amount of yes, difference. it does, yeah. So that's one thing which is a lot for relatively little, of course, you can spend hours doing it. So in that way, it's not little, but um, you, it is just the one thing. I, I love breaking things down, breaking things down. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of, mm -hmm. I've got horses and I do a lot of horse training and I have a great trainer and she breaks everything down to the smallest thing. And I have trained my horses to do wonderful stuff. I, I try to work at liberty with them, which means that you have no ropes or anything like that. It's just you and the horse in your area. And they respond so well when you when you teach them stuff. Tiny little things, you know, I'm, uh, uh, there's all sorts of stories which I won't, I won't go into, but when you really can break things down and analyse it, it's just wonderful because mm. it frees you mm. from thinking, exactly. oh, I need to be practising my concerto. Yeah. No, no, it frees yeah. you. It's just... That's exactly the word I was going to use. I was going to say it's liberating. Liberating, yeah. It is yeah. liberating. Yeah. And something that I have found is before um, a performance, if I'm anxious at all, I don't go... I go... Yes. And I think about everything. And I try and settle my body. I try and centre my body, centre my ear, centre my brain. And all those things put you on a good level, a good path, you know, for what what is mm, to come. Mm. So it is it is that centering is such a key yeah. key thing. Have you got any funny practice stories, either good practice or bad practice, or something that yeah. somebody's criticised you for, or you've heard going on, or anything? I mean, maybe I just sprung that on you. I'm just trying to think of something myself. Um, actually, I've got a relatively funny story. I was. Uh, in our, uh, I was in Aspen and, and music, the music school there and um, it's, in the, it's a summer um, school and I had been practicing till late into the night and I got a phone call because I was staying in school housing and I got a phone call from the front, of the front desk saying there'd been complaints uh, from uh, the other students um, in the, a, they were trying to get to sleep and I was practicing but that um, I'd been playing the same bar for about an hour yeah. and <laughs> Because you know everybody uh, obviously in this camp is, is musician. I mean, it's it's amazing how how mm. how careful people are about about people listening to people practice. Uh, I know people who were had had taken the whole house for the summer, and they would when they interviewed people to see what housemates they wanted, they actually interviewed them on the basis of how they practiced. Because in America, everybody is so it's so important to practice practice. Properly for them, for mm -hmm. them, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody has to be like that, but they didn't want to hear anybody who practiced badly. <laughs> so, so I was desperately embarrassed about that, and it, but it made me think. I thought, you're right. I've been playing that bar for an hour. What mm -hmm. am I trying to achieve from that? What have I achieved from that except to keep everybody up? <laughs> so, you know. But, so, uh, yeah. so maybe in that practicing that bar for an hour, you were just doing repetition. Yes, just it was playing just repetition. 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 What was I trying to achieve? Yeah. Some people do need repetition as well, but it was mindless repetition. Yes. It wasn't It wasn't a lovely shift repetition, yeah. which of course mm. is valid repetition. It was just, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. I just, yeah. You so hadn't got to the bottom of it at all. <laughs> no. No, I hadn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
No, so, I don't have any any practice stories that come to mind. Plenty of bad practice, but um, no, only that. In the past, I have lost my temper, and I'm sure that lots of people have. It can be very frustrating when you're not you're not achieving what you think that you should be able to do in that time mm. and in less focused days I have sent the stand flying I have sent things flying across the room <laughs> because I haven't known how to deal with it I haven't mm. it hasn't mm. gone mm. right as if yeah I'm feeling hard done by as yeah. if the music and the cello is against me yes. but that is really important is that practice should not be a punishment yeah sometimes practice the, the, the journey of learning an instrument can be so slow that we don't notice the brick that we've just put into place in our building at the time. We only notice it when we stand back two weeks later and look at the half a wall we've built. Mm -hmm. So that's why that frustration is terrible, isn't it? Because we expect it suddenly to be yeah. good, but it's not like that. Yes. It's like watching your baby walk. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it, nothing happens for ages. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they take one step. Yeah. And they're off. And they're off. Yeah. Yeah only to have to conquer more yes. as they grow, yes. and yes. that doesn't change, yes. it doesn't change. So it's all very well for us talking about this, but what happens when something goes wrong when we do it? For, I mean, I've noticed with a lot of my adult pupils, they get a very shaky bow arm mm. when they're concentrating on something, because yes. they're worried it's not going right. That's right. Do you, do you find the same? Yeah, I do. Um, not just adults as well, uh, children who are particularly anxious about doing the right thing. Yes. And and so um, the, the grip, the, the bow hold tends to be a grip. And with some people it is a vice-like grip. And there is huge tension in the wrist and up the arm. And mm. probably there's a blockage somewhere else in the body. Mm. Um, that in itself, if you have uh, a rigid grip on the bow and you try and control it, it's very hard to um, to keep it smooth because because you've lost the ability to be rubber like like kids are you know to 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 just sink into the string mm. and allow that sound to come out because what you are basically doing is you are enabling the cello to ring and and if you go at it mm. with a rigid grip or blockages anywhere in your body you're blocking the sound from coming mm, out. Mm. So it really is that you, it's up to you to coax that sound mm. out gently and sympathetically. It's like talking, isn't it? Because we just, yeah. everybody relaxes. Like, every, every time I stop it here, it doesn't pop out right. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, should be singing, Lynn. <laughs> so, continuing with Kim and Lynn's series, Watch This Space. Um, you had wanted to touch upon learning a piece, uh, approaching a piece of music? We can approach a piece of music. How about first, we just have a look at um, how do you undo tension in an arm? So how do you spot where that blockage might be and where is the, where is the culprit? Where is the, um, where, where is the tight muscle that you're not aware of? Because sometimes we're really not aware of them at all and it's only when somebody points something out and we go ah okay so it's really how to find that point mm, that's a good point maybe we could start away from the cello and see how your body feels and then when you sit down be very mm. noticing what changes mm. yes it's true yes i've always um I, I i tend to do it when i'm at home is i do when i'm going to practice i sit down and then I pick the bow up and I just, and then I stand up again and just try that again. Okay, I'm gonna get this sitting down thing. Right, I'm not going to um, sit down as if I'm the queen yes. sitting on a throne. I'm gonna sit down because I want to be here and I want this to be a pleasurable experience. As, as I said before, it's not a punishment. And so you sit down and you just take note of what's going on in your body and um, movement is good as well. Yeah, movement. Because I, I've noticed some of my pupils, they get their bow hold, and because I've said that's fantastic bow hold, 
they don't want to alter it. So they're like this and they were there. And you know, they, they, and I said, no, no, no. What you have to do is be able to get that at any moment and move in between. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are some bow, bow um, things that, uh, you know, we do climbing up and down the bow or yes. that sort of thing mm -hmm. so that you're not too rigid in your hand. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if you're rigid in your hand, you're going to be rigid here and mm -hmm. here. Exactly. And then we're going to go up your jaw too, as I'm just exactly. demonstrating, because I started going rigid in your hand exactly. like that. So, for the, this, yes, for those who haven't done this walking up the bow, it is really useful because yes. it, it's informative. Um, it is called a caterpillar and it is a matter of just walking your fingers, uh, keep the bow away from your cello just in case you <laughs> drop it, which has been known. Um, and it is a case of walking the fingers up and just being aware of any finger that is doing more work than the others, the thumb, obviously, if you let it go, you're, you're sunk. But it is a matter of finding a balance between all the fingers and and just lightly, like a spider, crawling up to the end of the, don't do it the other way, it's impossible. And then maybe finding the balance. So if you, if you rotate your arm and then you feel, you feel, where is the weight of the bow? Well, I can take all the fingers off except for my thumb and my first finger. Some people find it quite difficult to do that and to trust that you're not going to drop the bow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe put a crash mat or something underneath mm -hmm. and if you do drop the bow, it's, mm -hmm. it's okay. Up you go again, feel how light it is. It is a really light mm -hmm. thing. Your fingers do not need to grip. Wobble your arm around, you know, get those finger wings wobbling and then try the other direction and just see where the weight has transferred to so suddenly it's in the little finger if i if i take my little finger off the bow drops mm -hmm. so that way you haven't played a note but you're discovering what the, what is what is going on in these fingers and and how light a yes. hold you can have yes. and when you put the bow on the string with any luck you've you've created a, a softness about it so from what you're saying uh, it seems that trust is quite a large part of it, isn't it? Trust. trust. Is and if you do drop your bow, it happens. Yeah, it does happen. Yes. Yeah. Carbon fibre bows are very good Carbon because fibre. they don't break. Yes, yes, very good. And uh, the other thing that I find, and I find for myself too, if I'm doing a lot of practice, so I've got, you know, got, got something uh, hard to do, I, I need to remember to actually put my violin down every few minutes or whatever just mm -hmm. not to stay because i just i you know after an hour of standing in the same position practicing 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 um oh my back's killing me you know or or you're clenching yeah. your buttocks or something yeah. like that people we do strange things when we're concentrating i don't know how violinists sustain that position for hours and hours and hours i mean playing the cello is so logical and it's it's so centered and I mean, hugging the cello is just one of the greatest yeah. things. You can't hug your violin in that position. You know you what, what's going around. You know you where can. do you do it from? I'm going to teach you. I'll teach you. <laughs> but this, I have to say that actually hugging your cello is is also just a really useful way of finding a level with your arms. Sometimes when I say to people, say they've got a shift and, and their arm is stuck behind the shoulder, and I say just just bring your arm up yes. and around. They do this. Yes. Well, it's not up. Yes. If you hug your cello. You give yourself a lovely, um, a, a lovely gentle uh, indication of how your arm can help you get about the channel. Did you ever read um, Zen and the Art of Tennis, or Zen and Tennis, whatever it was? I can't remember if I read it or ordered it and didn't read yeah. it, but it's in it, it yeah. from many years ago. It's in my. It's a very good book memory. to read. It's a very inter It's very good and entertaining read. And I think it's in there that he speaks about how if you say to somebody, just you know, just reminded me of what you said, oh, you know, lift up your elbow, they'll go like that. Mm -hmm. No, 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 yes. lift up your elbow. We find it very difficult yes. to uh, do what we're asked to yes. do. Yeah, that's so true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's not because we can't do it. It's just that we don't, I don't know, we just don't. The, the information doesn't doesn't go to the right part of our brain yes, or something. that's right. Exactly. I've seen that so many times raise your arm and suddenly yeah. there's a vulture in the room <laughs> and so but exactly exactly that you know if you if you have little again part of your toolkit yes. if you have little 
exercises, stupid things. I did chicken wings with my pupils yes. just to get the idea that you're moving from the shoulder. You're not moving the shoulder. You're moving from the shoulder. Yes. And every movement you do, yes. whether you're doing an up bow, a down bow, A string, A string, C string, is from the shoulder. Yes. It is not the shoulder that does it. And so it's, it's so, so yes. important yes. to be able to um, be conscious of yes. that and find something that helps you, no matter how silly it is. Yes. Yeah. I do robot arm to all my pupils because it never occurs to them that they can open out their arm from here. Mm. They do this. Mm. Even the grown-ups do this. Yeah. And I go, have you ever... And I just hold this here, finger here, doing what I'm doing. Oh, it's like a revelation. Yeah, you know? yeah. Is there something but, but with a relaxed shoulder as well? Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. There's something very nice about um, using your practice in some ways to become conscious of yes. your body and conscious of your um, tension spots because they will be there every day. And so in some ways, practicing a cello and going into it like this is, um, is a nice way of affecting the rest of your life. And, and dealing dealing with things that maybe you weren't conscious of mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So what happens when, when we have a new piece of music, our teachers have handed us this piece of music, maybe gone through it in the lesson, put some fingerings in and things. Those are the kind of fundamentals. Um, so starting to practice a new piece of music in your own room. What would you say, Lynn? Uh, just play it through slowly, see where the um, difficult parts are, mm -hmm. see how, how much, I think there's a lot to be, um, a very great teacher of mine once said, um, you know, uh, we have to go and see, how, it's like looking in a linen basket, you have to work out where the dirty stuff is. And which is going to need more soap powder. It's not a great. I mean, it is a great. It is a great analogy, but it's a bit revolting, really. Um, and and the witty student that he was. It was in a master class actually. And he was and this witty student said, "Yeah, but I think that my my washing is going to be a lot dirtier than other people's." <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, it's just that really getting to know the piece, getting to know the piece before you can mm. evaluate mm -hmm. what sort of practice you need to yeah. do. I agree. I think getting an overview is yes, really important. Yes, yes. Not just starting right from the beginning, right first bar, bar two. Yeah, yeah. Because somehow having a sense of what is to come. Yes. And also that reassuring um, fact that what happens at the end of the piece is exactly the same as the beginning. Yes. It, it, it makes you feel, okay, so yeah. I may be just doing two lines, but actually I've done four. Yes, that's that's true. I very, I very often, if, when a kid asks to have first first two lines, last two lines, and then we'll fill in the bits in the middle because yeah. they already know what the journey is. Yeah, exactly. They know, they know yes. where, where that thing is that they need yeah. to grab. Otherwise, it's completely daunting. I mean, I, sometimes I have a new people come to play to me. They can't get through a piece of music. They have no idea how, mm -hmm. how long it is. Mm -hmm. They've got stuck on the fifth bar, and it's such a huge thing in front of them that they don't even, it's like this great black cloud hanging mm -hmm. over them. Yeah, that's right. It's very, it's very good to play through pieces, even if you can't play them. Yes. Even if you're faffing around in certain bits, play through, get an idea of the architecture. Yes, that's a really good way of putting it. And do you, um, I, do you think that um, practice, we've talked a lot about the single note and the focusing and the centering. Um, that is one part of your toolkit. Another part of it, I think, is the playing through is the having fun with it, yes. is doing, and, and also, you know, yes. sometimes when I'm working at something um, and I'm finding it difficult to, uh, to present it in a way, I do pretend, I have been known to sit there in the privacy of my own room and pretend to be Rostropovich. Yes. And just put on a whole new persona, persona and it's amazing how it alters yes. your, your delivery in a yeah, way. Yeah, that is weird to act the part. Is extraordinary. Act the part. Yeah, yeah. I tried that in an audition once, and it it really, really made me feel completely mm -hmm. different. Yes. I pretended I was I was somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, a great violinist. Yeah. You know. And it's that's a really good thing to hang on to because yeah. that again informs you um, of your own habit, which yes. is and your own habit is probably partly to think I can't do this. 
a lot of adults have said to me, you know, should I really be doing this? Oh, no, you know, I should give up. It's just a whim. No, you should be doing mm. it. And recognising that the, the thing that is holding you back is your your self-consciousness in a way. Mm. Mm. And, and actually, if you go and, you know, probably drink a bottle of vodka and pretend to be Rostropovich, amazing things happen. So... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Mind over matter is a big thing. Trust. Yes. They're big words yes. in practice. Rest within that practice. So yes. you're resting. I mean, any yeah. athlete will be stopping and, and you know rubbing his muscles yes. and stretching and all yes. that sort of stuff. And we're actually the same. It's, it's like an athlete. We're yeah. preparing for something which mm -hmm. is hugely physical. Yeah, it is. And 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 mental as well. Yes. I mean, I mean, yeah. uh, intellectual, yeah. not crazy. That brings up just another point, the physicality of it. Um, that is what your practice is, is the physical side. Yes. It's not the reading of the music. No, no. That's something else. Um, it's developing muscle memory. It's developing it? muscle memory. Yes, that is what your practice is about. Yes. So uh, when you're practicing, obviously, if you're learning a piece, you need the music, you need to be reading it. But the practice is um, maybe taking three bars, four bars, memorizing them, and then doing the physical exploration. Yes. Never be frightened to put something in slowly. I say to my pupils, um, how fast does a computer work? And they go, oh, super, super fast. It's all fast, fast as yeah, but how slowly do you think that information has been put in to the computer? Carefully and slowly, you know, the, the mm -hmm. programmer will be putting this stuff in. You know, when these things come up and it says about what the thing is, it's all just a series of like a thousand numbers and you're like, flip! Did somebody have to, you know, they're all yeah. lowercase and uppercase, Did some, how slowly would that have to be put in and carefully, mm -hmm. otherwise it's completely wrong. Yes. And then it can just spew it out fast. Yes. But yeah. We've run out of time for now, but um, I hope that you've, had, you've got something uh, that is useful and usable out of this. It's actually been really good mm -hmm. fun mm -hmm. and I felt so productive to be able to bounce ideas off Lynn and and to find out, um, yeah, you know, good. how much uh, how much we can share with this, yeah, and and yeah. so you know we both feel quite inspired to carry on and maybe do some more discussions because what we've touched on here, we've realised there is so much more, mm. and so um, you know maybe we will we will set up a another video at some point and um, share more ideas. Love so, to. Um, yeah. Absolutely love to. Yeah. Yeah. So, till then, yeah. thanks for joining us and um, bye from Jasper. Yeah. See you soon. Hi again. I hope that was useful. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, when you describe someone who practices badly, what characteristics are you including? Uh, first of all, I would say not warming up wouldn't be great practice because as we mentioned in the video, um, you are an athlete. You are, even as a beginner, you are doing something which involves muscle movement and repetition. And the last thing you want is to build up a repetitive strain injury. Uh, right at the beginning of your practice, obviously, you're going to tune your cello. And I see a lot of people tuning their cellos like this. If you do nice long bows, then for a start, you're warming up your arm and you're giving your ear a chance to hear, is that string really in tune? Uh, little pecks, like a... You can't hear the note, your ear hasn't hasn't really had the time to tune into what's going on. So start your practice with, um, you know, nice relaxed tuning up so that you can warm everything up as you go. Uh, other bad practices, I would say, um, you know, the warm up is so vital. So going into thumb position immediately um, is, is asking for trouble, I would say. Uh, that is something that you build up to and um, you know again warm your body up. Um, other bad practices I would say tackling something that um, 
tackling something too fast that you have not really studied, you haven't worked out where the problems are, you haven't worked out what is a good fingering. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, flapping around goes on up here. Um, I do think that you need to just look at the piece of music first, uh, get some help if necessary with some fingerings, or just spend the time, um, just spend the time working out options and seeing which one works best for you. Uh, that way you're also increasing your repertoire of fingerings and uh, uh, and then and then you know making fingerings for other pieces is going to come more easily as well. Um, everything I think that we do when we're practicing has got to be based on the physicality. The reading is something else. Somebody else has asked a question about let me just find it again sight reading. Sight reading is part of practice. I think um, sight reading is something that really comes along in leaps and bounds when you've joined an orchestra or a chamber group. Um, obviously, you can sight read to your heart's content at home. And um, whilst I say warm up and um, you know do the, do the slow practice, do the long notes and things, there is absolutely nothing wrong with sitting down and playing as many bark suites as you fancy um, and enjoying that but once you're warm always once you're warm um, sight reading is part of practice yes if that gives you pleasure and you have warmed yourself up you've tuned up your cello and um, you just want to play absolutely read through anything and like everything that uh, responds to practice sight reading will absolutely come along very fast with as much as you can possibly do. Uh, let me just see if there are any other questions. If you have a long practice session, how would you proportion out technical practice from your pieces? I think it's very personal and not just personal but, but depends on your mood that day, um, what are you trying to achieve, what are you preparing for. Certainly as an amateur what you don't want to do is make your practice session obligatory. Um, I've found in my practice as a, as a professional so the, there has been possibly more pressure to get things right quicker um, but no matter how the practice session has gone, and I've had plenty um, which have been less pleasurable, I have never ever once regretted doing that practice, um, no matter how I felt afterwards. But I do think that that's as a professional when the pressure is on. As an amateur, unless you've got something you know, coming up like a you know, performance class performance or something, as an amateur, I really think enjoyment is absolutely key to your practice and, and that how you divide it up depends on how things are going. You know, you can do a small amount, as, as we've demonstrated with the single bows and um, your single note, you can do a small amount of that to great effect. If you fancy carrying on for the next hour with that, then so be it, you know, carry on, if that's what's suiting you at the time. If you want to do five minutes of long bows and single notes, and then you want to play through some bark suites, so be it as well. I think it is very individual and there should be no hard and fast rules about that. Let me see if there are any more questions after that. I don't... Was there one before? Any tips on problems with aching left hand? Uh, again, this comes down to starting off with a warm up and checking your body. Just scanning from the feet up, checking as you're playing, you can be playing or you can just be sitting there. Um, where are any holding bits? Because they will affect your left hand. Uh, something in the shoulder can affect you know your thumb a lot of people who have thumb problems particularly in the in the bowing arm 
Um, I think I, I would say, after you've done that, check what's going on with your thumb. Is it gripping? It doesn't need to grip. It, in fact, it must not grip. Maybe try practicing with your thumb nice and bent. Check your thumb is nice and bent and not mashed against the back of the neck uh, like this. Try taking your thumb just a centimeter off the back of the neck so that it just floats with you. Is it being left behind? Is it pressing so hard that it's glued to the back of the neck and when you shift, you can hardly bring it with you? Keep it in that nice shape underneath your second finger, but let it float. Let it not touch the back of the neck and just see what that feels like. See if that changes how you work your left arm. Does that give you a little more sense of weight so that the fingers can come off rather than go on? Um, does it have an effect in your shoulder? Does it have an effect on your back? Explore, you, you do have to be a detective. I think when there's a problem, uh, obviously talk to your teacher if you have a teacher because they will be there to look at you and help you find problems that you can't spot. But do be a detective and, and see what's going on. You know, look for the problem and then find ways around solving them. The thumb, I think, is so often the cause, um, and that can be the, the result of a tight shoulder, or the shoulder can be a result of a tight thumb, which then tightens in the wrist. Um, maybe, some, maybe some gentle finger exercises, just lifting finger exercises to get them a little bit stronger so that you're not feeling that you have to squeeze. Let me see if there's anything else. I don't see any more questions. So I hope that the session really did um, provide some, some information that helps, helps with the practice and, um, and helps you just enjoy it. You know, as an amateur, you make the choice to play because you are enjoying it. It's, um, it's, it's not a, a lifeline in a financial way. So make sure that everything you do leads to the enjoyment of the instrument and if you're finding it's not um, please do talk to your teachers send me a message if you have any more questions uh, through the cello society and i'll do my best to answer them but in the meantime um, in the meantime if um, uh, if that's helped enjoy your practice and I hope to see you again one day. Bye.